Here at this hour is Brother Wayne Blake. This is his first time here, and he, uh, he we've known each other probably for 20 plus years or so. Uh, when he and he was wondering if I actually had a wife. I think there's a few others that are around that uh, have wondered the same thing, but uh, they see me often. But <laughs> well, I, I wonder that too. She is uh, a lot better than I deserve. <laughs> I know you would agree with that, <laughs> but I'm the one who said it. But Wayne's a good man. He's been a, a friend through the years. He and his wife, Laura, have one child, and she is with him, so at least uh, y'all get to meet uh, his wife. <laughs> he is a member of at the Fish Hatchery Road Congregation in Huntsville, Texas. I don't know if he has to put up with uh, Brother Stalting or Brother Stalting has to put up with him, or maybe it's both. <laughs> he is also a graduate of the Spring Bible Institute. Uh, thus, uh, David was one of his teachers and now then you might know why he has the problems that he does. Uh, <laughs> but we appreciate him. He speaks on several lectureships and gospel meetings. He also directs Bible camps, uh, so there's an interest in young people. Uh, we're glad that he's with us this year and going to be speaking on the subject, uh, Building Better Homes. I appreciate being able to speak here this morning. I guess I need to turn this thing off. I forgot. Okay. I appreciate being able to speak here this morning. Uh, I appreciate the invitation to be here. This is the first time I've ever been to Florida. Uh, I was going on the other side of the country as far as I was concerned, and I thought, great, I'm going to go down there, and the weather's going to be good. And First night we got here, it was. It was a very nice night, and it was a little rainy and that kind of thing. The next day, I thought, I thought I came to Florida instead of stayed in Texas. <laughs> and it's been about the same. In regards to Mike, well, yes, I have known him for several years, and the thing is, has, he always said he had a wife. Always. And I, okay. Well, uh, one day he finally got tired of me asking, are you sure you have a wife? And he opened up his billfold and showed me pictures. And I said, those came with the billfold, didn't they? <laughs> but uh, I uh, respect Michael a lot. He's a good friend and a fellow laborer in the vineyard, and I am very proud of him and the work that he does here, as well as the elders and the stand that you have for the truth. The subject I have at hand is dealing with primarily a time to build the home. And in the allotted 37 minutes that I've been given, I'm not going to even hardly scratch the surface in dealing with this subject. I preached a series on the home, and it was a 10 lesson series, and I still had things I really wasn't finished saying. This is a huge subject, and it is a matter that is of utmost importance, particularly it seems, I know I'm sure every generation says that, but it seems like it's more important today than it was necessarily, you know, maybe a few years ago. And maybe that's because now I'm a father. And most particularly a father of a daughter, not a son. And I'm concerned about her. I worry about her. And I worry about the life that she's going to have in the future. And so this morning we embark upon the idea of building the home. You think about your past. I remember as a young man growing up and, you know, we lived on a 70-something acre farm. We didn't own it. We rented it. 
But I had the run of 70 acres. And I got out and I knew every inch of that place. And I could leave before, I, you know, right barely at daybreak and come back after dark. And my mom and all would, well, what'd you do today, son? Well, and just a whole list of things, just exploring. And that was my life. That were the things that I did as I was growing up as a young teen. I wasn't concerned about outside influences in the sense of the things of this world that our young children are having to worry about now. There weren't predators and people that were seeking to cause me harm. I enjoy the summers of thinking about shooting snakes because I don't like live snakes and I really don't like dead ones, but I prefer they be dead and far, far away from me. Taking a BB gun and later on pellet gun and later on shotgun. Go hunting. Scared to death you're going to have to actually kill something. <laughs> well, I was concerned more about the mud that I had gotten all over me from the previous day, knowing that I was going to have to go home and mom was going to be very upset with me and have to wash me down with a water hose on the back porch before I could ever come into the house. You see, those were the things I was concerned about. We got up every Sunday morning, privileged to be able to go to worship. Saturday night, we were in bed early because we were going to be prepared for the Lord's Day. And my fondest memories from beginning at a very early age were going to worship. Going to worship. Wednesday night, it was out of the question if I had something else to do. We were going to be at worship. The gospel meetings, lectureships, we didn't have really lectureships back then, but we had gospel meetings. And we were there every time the door was open. You think things were a little different then. Now you take a snapshot of the present and you see a different world, a different mindset. You know, you have children today, parents. You turn on the television, you go to Walmart, come to Florida, and you look around you and see all manner of things that people are wearing. No, let's rephrase that. Things they're not wearing. You don't have to come to Florida to see that. Every town that you live in. The thing that is so sad to me is morality is a thing of the past in the mindset of many today. We teach our young children that they need to look like Brittany or, Bar or Barbie. Be concerned about wearing as little as possible and looking as mature and as old as you can. And our parents today are even allowing their children. In fact, they're not only allowing it, but they're pushing them toward growing up at such an early age. Eight, nine-year-old little girls wearing makeup that their mother helped them apply in the morning of cheerleading, pet squads. All manner of dances, things like this, that parents are pushing their children into and not realizing that all the while they've got a child that's running around immodestly dressed. And and I say girls because I'm thinking my daughter, but I'm thinking I, I'm, I want to all of us to realize when I say children, I'm talking about boys and girls. Because even little boys are wearing some of the most outrageous things. And the sayings that people wear on their shirts and on the back of their shorts. My wife found this for me and I found it very interesting. You know, we live in a world that we come up with all conceivable sicknesses. We look at all these things that are nothing more <clears throat> than allowance for bad conduct and sin. 
Alcoholism is a disease. Now there's no doubt in my mind that there are things that have to do with chemicals and things about your body, but you know something? If you never would have drank the first drink, you wouldn't be an alcoholic. You look at children today. My wife found this for me. She's, she's in education. It's called ODD. Odd. They say that a lot of children are being diagnosed with this. And what it stands for is a disruptive antisocial behavior. Let me read you the clinical diagnosis of one who has odd. They have frequent temper tantrums. Excessive arguing with adults. They have active defiance and refusal to comply with adult requests and, and rights and rules. There are deliberate attempts to annoy or upset people. They blame others for his or her mistakes or misbehavior. Often being touchy or easily annoyed by others. Frequent anger and resentment. Mean and hateful talking when upset. And seeking revenge. Do you know that is a true clinical diagnosis for children? That's a clinical diagnosis. If you think about that diagnosis, that would miss that would deal with a majority of my brethren, adults. <clears throat> it's an excuse to condone sinful activity. And we're diagnosing it, giving them drugs, helping them out, sending them to psychologists and, and all these kind of things, psychiatrists, psychologists. Teachers and parents are not allowed to spank or, and many times, even uh, be upset by this type of activity, this behavior. We see immodesty allowed and encouraged in our children. Parents don't want to be authorities, authoritative. They want to be their children's friends. I've heard people call their children buddy, pal, and all types of little pet names in addressing their children because they want to be the friend. They don't want to be the parent. Children can hurt their parent. They can hit them. They can curse them and even defy them. But we allow it because we don't want our children to hate us. That's the world we live in. I was sitting in a doctor's office with my daughter <laughs> uh, less than a month ago. And there was a young little boy, maybe three, four years old. And his mother told him no. And I saw him literally, fist doubled up, punch her in the chest. And I don't mean a playful. I'm talking angry, grit in your teeth, and rear back and hit this woman. Tears were coming to her eyes. And all she said was, don't do that. I'm sorry. I almost picked the child up myself and spanked him. I just did. I almost did. Takes a village? Well, let me be the village. <laughs> I'll do what you will not do and what you should do. Let me handle that. That child will never hit another adult again. If they do, they will deal with the consequences. Instead of, don't do that. She was so calm. I don't, I don't know. We want our children to have privacy. And in that, we don't ask them where they're going. We don't ask them what they're doing. We don't look and see what they're doing on the computer. We don't care who they're calling on their cell phones, who's text messaging them, and what kind of conversations are going back and forth. We don't want them to be unsafe physically, so therefore we give them birth control and then condoms. Because we need to prepare you. 
We don't want you to do drinking and drugs out into this unsafe world, so come into my house and we'll have the party here. Because then at least I can watch what you're doing. We want our children to be in, encouraged to be in extracurricular activities. And, and understand when I say this, I'm not saying that extracurricular activities in and of themselves are wrong. I'm not. Because children need to be involved in those type of things if possible. But sometimes we can pile more on their plate than they deserve. We can put things on top of children to the point where they begin missing Sunday evening worship. Wednesday worship. Bible classes. The prom. There are hundreds of thousands of millions and millions of dollars spent every year for children to go to the prom. Because parents don't want to tell them no. We don't teach from the Bible anymore. We don't have Bible classes, Bible studies at home anymore because, well, they get that on Sunday and Wednesday. I've got too many other things to do. The youth minister, he's the one. He can plan the activities. He can entertain our children. Because, you know, we don't want them to be tested and questioned about things about the Bible and come home with homework and things from their Bible classes because they get that in school. Don't give them those things. We look out in this world and our homes are surrounded. We're surrounded by homes where there is no father present. My wife told me in a second grade class of 18 students, there were only two students who had a mother and father in the home. And this is a typical school. One classroom with 18 students. Only two had parents at home. Both parents. And we wonder why children are left on their own. And why they feel so neglected. Marriage is looked upon as nothing more than just, well, it's a commitment, kind of, sort of, as long as you make me happy. But when I'm not happy anymore... then I'm out. You know, if we had that attitude, think about it, brethren. Husband or wife, if you had that attitude, how long would it have been before you'd be divorced? I was irritated my wedding day, and I may have been upset with my wife. Therefore, let's have a divorce, because you're not making me happy. This isn't what everybody told me it was going to be like. Well, the mindset of many today. And I could go on and on and on, but the idea here is, is that this just doesn't even scratch the surface of the problems in the present day that we're having with our families. So let's look at the home in general. From the Garden of Eden to the present, God had a plan. Left on his own, man will change that plan and therefore turn it into something God never intended the home to be. I don't dare to think that I have all the answers, because I don't. And I don't dare to think that I have all the ins and outs of everything, but I can know what the scriptures teach. And I need to pattern my life after that. And so this morning, boy, that was a long introduction, wasn't it? 20 minutes. Whew. Okay, we got to get moving. Dealing with the home. No institution so affects society as the home. And if you think about it, it shows the wisdom of God. He put a man and woman in the garden and said, Be fruitful and multiply. And by that action, by producing children, they began society. Rules and others governed by the laws of God. And that home would be successful in as much as if they allowed themselves to adhere to the will of God. Well, the same is today. If we want a home that functions properly, we must do it God's way. We can't go looking into uh, Spock and all these other types of areas. 
We have to go to the Word of God. Or our homes aren't going to work the way God wants us to do. Today, I, I, I remember reading this, and I'll put this in here. We think about society today and their attitude toward marriage. I remember reading of a woman who had entered into her 23rd marriage with a man who this was going to be his 21st marriage. That was in the first century. Not recently. We're talking 2,000 years ago. So you think we got problems with divorce today. Folks, man has always had problems with divorce. Because they chose to do it their way. As opposed to the will of God. Society can be affected by the home, so can the church. The church in any given community will never be as strong as the strength of the average home in that church. Now think about that. This congregation will only be as strong as the homes that comprise that church, that local congregation. That's God's plan. You provide all the things that you need to do at home, and then you bring them into the atmosphere of the congregation, and that congregation will work effectively if you do it God's way. In the book of Ephesians, Paul discusses the duties of each, the husband, the wife, and the children. And what we're going to do is, is go from here and begin dealing with the husband, wife, and the children. But first we want to begin with marriage. History shows us that it is a natural thing for man and a woman to enter into some type of relationship where the home is established and children are born. God instituted the first home in marriage with Adam and Eve, as we see in Genesis 2, verse 21 and following. The Bible is very clear that all the rights and things and privileges that come through marriage are to be, are to be gotten through marriage. And any of those other rights and privileges that are, taking, that are taken before marriage, that's sin. Because God has a place for those rights and privileges. To change it only changes God's will. The modern movement pushing same-sex marriage is not authorized by God and is condemned with all other types of activities like fornication. The marriage is to be held in honor and undefiled. Marriage today is under attack and we must uphold it and honor it. The new thing that you see is cohabitation. Or living together. I got several websites and things that I've been going to and just kind of reading up. But to boil it down, it basically says this. The divorce rate is going down. Did you know that? It is. But you know what's replacing it? People living together. What's happened is a lot of our young people are now just living together. And they're having children in that relationship. But they won't take that next step because of what their parents did. You see, a lot of situations that I have found, and this is not every situation, but a lot of situations that I found is, is that the children, they've come out of a relation out of a home where the mother and father may have been married two, three, four times. And they look at that and they say, Well, if my parents can't figure out a hold of marriage together, then I sure can't, and I'm not going to go through that. Therefore, I'll just live with you. And by living together, what begins happening is children are born into that union. Well now, what studies and society, what, well, to me, common sense would tell you, let's say now I have two children, in this cohabitation, living together relationship, and now I can't live with you anymore. Common sense tells you whether you are married or you're living together, 
those children still suffer because you're breaking what they know of as the home. So see, the situation is still the same. You're still teaching your children that you can't make a commitment and stay with it. God instituted marriage. Statistics of cohabitation are phenomenal. In 1965 through 64, cohabiting consisted of only about 11% of the homes. By 1999, over half of all marriages, think about this, over half of all marriages were preceded by cohabitation. That's a lot of marriages. Across all age groups, there is a 45% increase in cohabitation. Some estimate that between 60 to 80% of all marriages are preceded by cohabitation. And what we're seeing is that marriage has changed, finding is that ch marriage has changed and many are reacting to the growing number of divorces that have become a way of life in our society. God is not pleased and neither should we who are the faithful. This is not what God had in mind when he instituted the home. Let's look at parents very quickly. When well, one is a single or newly married, I really, I've cut this down. I went through here and X'd out stuff. Don't talk about this. I mean, whew. When one is single or newly married, you don't even understand what it's like to be a parent. Now, you can listen to people tell you but until you become a parent, you really don't know what it's like to be a parent. And everybody's child is an angel. Even though you may be saying, take that child out now, he's still an angel. A few months and, and years that go by in the beginning, you're growing into your marriage. We're getting used to the idea of finding someone that we, have, that we live together with our work, as well our secular work, as well as the work that's needed to be done in church. We have all types of information telling us how to be a good parent. Dr. Spock, Red Book, Modern Parenting Magazine, Reader's Digest, and the list goes on and on. Folks, we don't need those things. We just need the Bible. And something I have found is common sense in dealing with children. I can't give you a clinical definition of anything that my daughter thinks and how she thinks and why she's thinking the way she is. I look at it as nothing more than her hormones are beginning and she's going to turn into a woman eventually so I have to just kind of overlook things. <laughs> kind of like you do with your wife. That's just how they are. That's how God made them. No, I'm just kidding. But I have said that to her many times. <laughs> but God wants us to be students of the Word and to relate, regulate our lives and our homes regarding the Word. Abraham was commended in Genesis 18 and verse 19 that he would command his children and his household after the Lord. Parents, we need to be those type of parents. In what way was Abraham successful? Because he did what God commanded to be done. Paul addressed marriage and showed how it was like a relationship between Christ and the church. Ephesians 5, verse 22 and following. Christ died for that church, and therefore the husband must be willing to, to give all that he can to make sure that his wife is taken care of and that the home is what God wants it to be. In the corporate world, any business that's going to be successful, it must have a leader 
that makes the final decisions regarding the direction of the company. And in common sense, a home cannot have co-leaders. It must have a leader in that home. And all others submit to the leadership. That doesn't say that a woman can't say something, can't uh, counsel with the husband. And in fact, it ought to be done. Because I'm not a dictator. We're not dictators. We're open for discussion to deal with any kind of situation. There are things my wife overrides me on often in dealing with my daughter. Not in front of her, but off to the side. You know, you said that, but think about what you just said to her. Uh, yeah, you're right. So, we need to be very careful and realize that God has established a home and He wants to order the way it is. In society we live in today, the Christian must obey God rather than man. Acts 5 verse 20. And this needs to be established before the wedding. Did you hear what I said? This needs to be established before the wedding. If your wife or your husband is not on board on what God expects of them in the home, don't get married. Don't get married. Work it out before you get married. There's going to be enough chaos and turmoil in a home, especially at the beginning. You know, yeah, men are animals and women are the polite society ones. We can live in a shoebox and a woman wants a home. There's a lot of turmoil going on there. Well, establish those things before you get married. Make sure that that man that you want to marry is going to make a Christian, faithful Christian father and husband. And men, make sure that woman, yes, yeah, she's pretty. She makes you all goofy, sweat, and everything else you're going to do. But make sure she's going to be a wife that God would be pleased with. <clears throat> if our career and our independence is important to us, then don't get married. And especially don't have children. If those two things are important to you, don't have children. Let me tell you something I have learned, and I didn't really know this. You, you, you older parents didn't tell me this. It takes work to have a kid. To tend to them, to take care of them, to, to just be there for them. That takes work. They don't just raise themselves. You know... You gotta make sure their hair's fixed. You gotta get them up earlier in the morning if you're gonna be somewhere on time and all these kind of things. It takes work. Someone didn't put that in the contract when they told me about children. They didn't put that in there. And if I'm concerned about my job and about me selfishly, who's gonna be harmed? Not me, because I'm taking care of me. My children are going to be harmed. So if you don't want to put those children in their right perspective and take care of them, don't have them. One of the greatest things a parent can do is to be faithful to God. And by being faithful, then they pass that on to their children. If God, the church, spiritual things are not important, and first in your life, our children are going to see that. You always hear about people that say, you got to be very careful what you say around children because they repeat it. And especially parents, you've got to be very careful what you say around your, ch your children. That's very true because they're a sponge. Somebody said we're not a sponge last night. I understand the context they're saying. But they are a little tape recorder. And they play back. At their own whim. Not at my whim, their whim. And they'll repeat things. 
and they'll take attitudes about things. And if you don't put God first, that child will suffer. And as we began, the church will suffer. And society will suffer. Because your child, left on his own, would become a ward of the state. And there will be people that will take care of them, give them showers, and give them food while they sit in an eight by five cell for years. It saddens me the attitude so many have toward children and how they allow them to basically run on their own. Very quickly, and then I'm going to, well, I don't, I'm not going to, I have to step down. <laughs> children. I want to say this very quickly. Children. Our generation is so removed from the, way, from the days when we could work in the hot sun and take on chores that would not, that would break our backs. Now, I agree, I, I didn't have those kind of chores either. But, the biggest chores a child has today is cleaning up the room. Now granted, I don't like doing that either. No. Don't put that on her. She has to work too. Um, but I don't, I, I don't like doing that either. But it has to be done. They may even have to carry out the trash at times. And sometimes it's a battle to get them to do it. But it must be taught at a young age. And that child must accept responsibility in that home. And a three-year-old, she reminds me daily that everything I say comes back to haunt me. And most times it's funny, it's cute. But sometimes it's embarrassing. <laughs> and then you go, I said that. We need to do this and be willing to time to spend on our children and our children to realize that discipline is a part of their life. A child cannot be left on their own and they must be disciplined. They must be dealt with. And when I say discipline, that doesn't mean every time spanking. And for someone to leave a child undisciplined is the same reason, the same reasoning uh, same thought that comes back to me is this. If you have a brother or sister in Christ who's in sin, and you won't tell them of their sin, discipline, and you allow them to die in their sin, you do not love that brother or sister. If you have a child, and you allow them to do anything and everything, and you want to be their pal, and you will not correct them, you really don't love that child. You may think you do, but you really don't. And the same principle has already been dealt with on this lectureship in regards to discipline in principle goes toward our children also. We must be willing to discipline. Our society is showing that we as a family are in trouble. It's time for us to restore the home as God would have it. If a parent will not have fulfilled your obligations as a parent, then repent of it and begin to build your home as God would have it. If a child, you're not being obedient to your parents, repent and begin to build your home. Also dealt with grandparents and other things in this lesson, but that's all the time we have this morning. I appreciate your attention.